Hi, I'm John the Engineer Termel, King of the Poppers, and I was on the Dragon's Den a while back, pitching them the idea of investing in their own community currency. And this is the uh, certificate that they gave out to all the contestants who went and faced the Dragon's Den, including me, who <laughs> billed myself as the King of the Dragons. So these are the dragons from the Dragon's Den with Diane Buckner, the co-host, the host on the right-hand side lady. And uh, these are the dragons who listen to people pitching their inventions, looking for financing, and then try and buy them out. So I got an invitation to go to the Dragon's Den. That was on May 27th, a letter from Richard Mayerov from cbc.ca. And uh, he says, I'm a producer for CBC show Dragon's Den. Don't know if you're familiar with it, but we are currently taping our fourth season to be aired this fall. You can find out about the show and watch episodes from last season at our website, which is cbc.ca slash Dragon's Den. Well, I've scanned across, I've come across it, but inventors and innovators trying to get investment to engineer their good idea never kept my attention long. When I'm trying to build a world where everyone had credit at the National Bank to back their try at whatever they qualified for. No need for investors with a sugar daddy interest-free loan, right? So how can they profit from giving everyone else interest-free loans other than quintupling markets for useful things? I'm going to have to explain to them. So he says, I'm contacting you on the off chance that you would be interested in pitching the Dragons for our show very soon, early next week. So I said, don't these guys know that there's a media blackout on John Termel, the engineer? I got the crown to drop the charges against 4,000 people, and they didn't even mention my name. Remember this article here? 4,000 charges dropped, and they didn't even mention my name. Yes. So I once did a CTV interview that was too hot to broadcast, so they said they'd forgotten to turn on their audio. Har har, professionals. I guess the person interviewing me didn't notice he couldn't hear what I was saying. I hope CBC find a better excuse if this proves too hot to handle. Let's face it, I love being brutal with nerds. Must control, must control, must control myself. So anyway... Here is an article out of the Hamilton Spectator titled Into the Dragon's Den, which explains what it's all about. Quote, they came face to face with dragons and survived. That much we know. What we don't know is whether any of them are richer for it. A group of about a dozen Hamilton and area entrepreneurs were chosen to pitch their ideas to five wildly successful Canadian business people for the popular CBC series Dragon's Den. Some pitchers get lucrative deals. The Dragons invested about $9 million for a stake in a wide variety of ventures last year. The unlucky, the unprepared, and the foolish get burned. Contestants are forbidden from disclosing whether they were offered a deal until their pitch is shown. All will be revealed when the show returns for its fourth season in the fall. The entrepreneurs don't even know whether their den debut will survive the cutting room. CBC will only broadcast a third of the 300 pitches it filmed, but that exposure can often be critical as a deal. So the show held the auditions in Hamilton for the first time in March, and I went for my audition in Toronto, and that was in May. So, goes on. Uh, uh, he says, I don't know what kind of projects you have going on currently, or if there's something you've been trying to get off the ground, but maybe there's something that you could plausibly see pitching to the dragons and i wrote this is my blog of course i've been pitching interest-free bankers to voters now for nigh on 30 years so facing a pentuplet of dragons won't phase a professor of banking systems engineering as long as we stay on the topic of banking systems engineering to global time trading so rm <clears throat> typically Pitchers come in with a business, either in the concept stage or a few years of sales, and give up equity in their company for a specific amount of investment. And the Dragons are looking for a return in the next three to five years. But we could accept a less typical pitch if you have a suggestion in mind. Well, I thought my problem is that I'll have to convince them that rather than invest in a time bank just to make a profit, invest in a time bank to, to save you and your community and make a profit. More philanthropic than commercial, but I must show a profit either way. RM, if you have, a, you have a unique background and public speaking skill, that might be interesting for our show. 
I said, well, I've always stolen the show with my world-changing Unilets pitch. Should be no different now. RM, this is very last minute. We only have five more possible pitch days left beginning this Saturday and ending on Wednesday of next week. Pitches typically last around 20 minutes and take place in our CBC studios downtown Toronto. Okay, so typically if I grab their attention and if it's important enough, they can let it go on longer. I hope I could throw in some verse. RM, thanks for letting me know if this might interest you as soon as possible. We can discuss it further. Cheers, Richard Myrov, assistant producer, CBC Television, Factual Entertainment. So, I wrote back and say, sure, this would surely be the most unusual pitch because I'm not going to be wanting to profit by it. And you're supposed to offer them a money-making corporate proposal or proposition or invention. But here's my first thought. I hear some of them are pretty rich, one with hundreds of millions and a couple from Toronto. So here's what I'll try to pitch. Looking at the growth of the time-based community currency systems, let's time dollars, time banks, Ithaca hours, where hours of human work are collateral for the chips, and cash-based community currency systems, Berkshire, Toronto dollars, where cash buy-ins with premiums or discounts are collateral for the chips, I advise a combination of both. Chips issued on the basis of time and chips issued on the basis of cash at a premium. Dragons could start up time-based currencies in their communities or buy into a cash-based community currency like Berkshire's or Toronto dollars or Calgary dollars, right? When you buy in for Berkshire's for 100 bucks, they give you a premium of 110 in community chips to spend locally. You cash out at the same rate you bought in, so there's no risk. It's just like buying in chips at a casino. Well, actually, this was a mistake. I should have said that you buy in for 95 and they give you 100. But there's also the Pittsburgh Plenty, which is another community currency, where you buy in for 90 and they give you 100 community currency and an extra ninth. That's 11% profit on your money right up front. So um, anyway, that's 5% available out of a discount available at Berkshire's, 10% discount available at uh, Pittsburgh which is uh, an 11% premium if you count it that way. So, now of course, here are the Toronto dollars. This is the flyer I've been showing around for years of the Toronto dollar system and their currency run out of St. Lawrence Market. And I have a few pages here from the Calgary dollar system. Economic gloom spurring interest in Calgary dollars. And it says learn more about the Calgary dollars. What are the Calgary dollars? And in this other article, it says Calgary Dollars has seen its membership double since Christmas. Well, yeah, when bad times happen. But in Calgary, you can use your Calgary Dollars to buy your bus tickets, probably your bus passes. So why would you take a $100 bill, go buy a bus pass, when you could take your $100 bill, get one ten in community currency, and then go buy your bus pass? So much smarter, right, for poor people to use the community currency. You can do it, too. So, uh, so the Canadian Dragons, who bought into the Toronto dollar system, would make an immediate 10% profit. Non-taxed, because it's not real money, on $100, but only taxable when they spend it, when it acts like real money. If they, gave, if they have employees in Toronto to help them spend locally, great. But better yet is to help induce everyone into Toronto to accept the Toronto dollars by giving the city of Toronto a Toronto dollar account and then let the city borrow a billion or two interest free as long as it's only used to pay for people's service and not debt service and can be used to pay our taxes. These cash buy-in models like Toronto dollars, Calgary dollars, enjoy what I call the Sparta effect. They get the interest from the cash while it's in the bank while buyers get a 10% premium to spend locally. If you don't have a community currency nearby for you to make this profit, start one. Luckily, there is an already existing Toronto dollar system, so I'm going to ask them to put half a billion dollars into the Toronto dollar system account, get $550 billion in Toronto dollars, and prepay a half a billion taxes to Toronto City Hall. At the same time, get the Toronto dollar system to print up another couple of billion in Toronto dollars and lend them to the city interest-free on the condition that any Toronto dollars spent in the upkeep of the city may be used to pay Toronto taxes. 
That's what I'd do if I had big money to get not only my automatic 10% on my whole bankroll, but help my community fund its services too. Now imagine if instead of putting the cash in the bank, the millionaire permitted it, half of it to be micro-loaned out, interest-free, to new indebted members who offer time and skills. So take all that cash and lend it to the city interest-free, or take all that cash and make micro-loans to the members interest-free. But when a member is finally out of debt, he continues banking his surpluses, which are loaned out interest-free to the next generation of soon-to-be-free debtors. What an incredible amount of good could be accomplished with the merging of the time-based currency with the cash-based local currency and micro-lending the cash. Now, I'm trying to get them to help me market a do-it-yourself banking software to free the debt slaves of the world. And I have to show it's so much in their best interest Whatever business they are in will benefit from tapping in on the underground economy's new time-based currency markets. That it's worth setting up the new Unilets trapeze to do some personal gymnastics. So I got a letter back saying, hi, find attach a copy of the Dragon's Den Contestant Guide. Whole bunch of pages explaining what's going to go on. Again, we have your book to pitch on Sunday, May the 31st in Toronto. So good stuff. I'm going to go. Then a letter back saying, hi, Jesse here for the Dragons Den, hoping you're having a good time gearing up for the chance to face the Dragons on May 29th. And I said, face the Dragons! They'd better gear up to face the world's toughest combat engineer. If they don't know their stuff, I'll make them look like low-tech. I guess they may not play the piece if I'm too rough. I guess I'll have to go easy on the slower ones. So, some more information regarding your pitch. And I've been booked in the afternoon time slot, and they explain what's going to go on. They're going to give me a tour of the place, and then we go on. So the contestants guide did say that there's no guarantee they will use anybody's pitch. So I better not be too brutal, though I know brutality is what people love to watch. But I'll have to be gentle with the slower learners. At least you'll be able to read what went on with the King of the Poppers and the Dragon's Den, even if it's too hot for them to broadcast. Anyway, the show is to be broadcast in the fall, and I think it's fair that I not reveal whether the dragons decide to invest or not, unless cops are called or something melodramatic happens. So I'm off. We'll get to see if the dragons have ears, to, eyes to see and ears to hear. So anyway, I show up at the Dragon's Den for my, in my, my show, and uh, before I go into it, I prepared my kit of stuff I was going to bring along. So, of course, I was going to bring along the Time Dollar book, which is the key wording, and I like having my picture taken with that. And at the same time, I was going to be able to bring along a copy of the Fair Shares booklet from the, from the UK, which shows all these people doing trades amongst each other from one person to another, to another, to another, to another. Then I could have pointed out how, wow, in France, it's the same thing. All these different people doing trades with each other because they're using an alternative currency rather than sitting there unemployed. So, now, of course, I was going to have to bring along my newspaper articles. And, of course, here we have CNN, which is some community currencies are printing their own currency. CNN, it's pretty big, right? Should be important enough. The next one is, uh, oh, this is about the Pittsburgh Plenty, where they explain that it's, a, you know, they give $90 and you get 100 which is 11% on your money. Then, of course, you have USA Today, biggest newspaper in America. Communities print their own currency to keep cash flowing. Then you have the Financial Times, noted for trust, talking about community currencies. And then after the Financial Times, you have the MSNBC News, another big one, virtual currencies gain in popularity. And then you have... Foxnews.com, another big one. Communities print currencies to keep money local. Then The Economist did an article titled The Money Go Round. Then F Detroit Free Pass did an article called Time Banks Pay Off for Community. Yes. And then, of course, Forbes Magazine did an article, Funny Money. And it was not very funny, you know, it's working. Then the Wall Street Journal did an article called When It Comes to Cash, a Thai village says bot, humbug, and bot means the, uh, the currency they use over there. And then Mandelson backs New People's Bank at the post office from the UK Guardian, big article. 
And then finally, the Times Online says, um, is interest-free lending inevitable? Well, yes, it is. It is inevitable. It is coming. So we're not going to be able to stop it. So here's all this proof that community currencies are spreading around the planet. Now, I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to have to try and grab their attention. So I'm going to have this little uh, gambler's crusader packet out of my book, which explains that I was Ottawa's gambling crusader. I kept trying to run games. I kept getting busted with the biggest gaming houses in the country's ever seen. And uh, pleading guilt, not pleading guilty, but being found guilty and then busted again in Ottawa with the biggest gaming house ever seen. And then Termel ran on his game, says the cop. And then playing for a deal because they're going to put me in jail unless I can do community service. And finally, I did manage to get out and do community service instead. So that's where I made the million dollars that summer. But what did I do with that million dollars? Well, that gives me a key into, as the gambler, I ran in my first election to legalize gambling. And then I found out about interest rates. And I found out and I said, how come a casino chip, a Brantford $500 casino chip, never loses its value, while the government's currency loses its value? What's going on? Both hardwares are identical. How come one inflates and the other doesn't? Inflation must be a software problem. So I managed to tell that to them. But anyway, then I talked about my cases going to the top. I was going to mention Bank of Canada Gaming House because charging interest creates a death gamble, which is a fee for the privilege of participating in gamble. I went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, got thrown out there. Then I charged them again, went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada again. And again, they wouldn't do anything about it. It threw me out again. And so I kept fighting. I started picketing banks all over. This was picketing Parliament in Toronto, making the news. This was picketing out in British Columbia. This was picketing out in Calgary, where at the same time I was showing people how to stall their foreclosures. And Mrs. Drabic was the wife of a man who was being evicted, and he'd unfortunately taken the bailiff hostage and was now in jail. But it says here, Termel plans to clog the courts with interest rate pro protests. And this was my anti-foreclosure kit that I used to provide to people with the forms to fight their foreclosures. And, of course, that leads up to my more protesting where I was picketing the IMF World Bank in 1982 all alone with my banker's starved third world babies picture. And that's where I was handing out my flyer that said, why bring your million dollar bond to New York to get a million dollars in bills, spend it, tax it out with interest to pay New York when you could print up a whole bunch of one dollar bonds, spend them, tax them out, no interest. And this was the biggest score I ever pulled up to that point. Cash starved Argentine provinces turning to their, out their own money and they decided to start paying all their employees with provincial bonds and it worked perfectly. So, continuing on, I was going to explain how I was the candidate with the solution in my pocket because I had my program to reprogram the Bank of Canada's computer on a diskette. And here's another point where I'm picketing the Queen, and it mentions that the Queen leaned forward to read the simple message, Abolish Interest. So, a lot of people got our message. This is when I was put into the anthology of great Canadian characters. He also ran and ran and ran because I kept running for Parliament. And in 1993, after the big bust, I spent a million dollars founding my own political party, the Abolitionist Party, who have zero interest. Here's a picture of me running for Prime Minister against Jean Chrétien. And the question says, who would you vote for, my monkey with the let software or one of the other candidates who don't have any software? And then finally, the abolitionist monetary policy favored by the USS Enterprise. Mr. Spock would be proud of our 1 over S money system. And uh, finally, in 1997, I'm into the Guinness Book of Records for running in more elections than anyone else in history. Didn't go to my head because in the American version, they put me on the same page as the world's biggest bagel. And, of course, it lets the media have fun with me saying stuff like, Super Loser fails again when I lost to Sheila Copps in 1996. But, one month later to the date of that headline, we get an article in a Hamilton Spectator saying, Creating work by working together, Hamilton self up group starts Hamilton Let's mission accomplished but still articles around the world from the Arizona report world's richest pauper perennial candidate and here's a copy of my 
Guinness record from the Guinness record people. And then finally in 2000, I get invited to the United Nations. You remember when all the world's most, uh, all the world's leaders were there, all the biggins? Well, I was there too. And in the Millennium Declaration, Resolution C6, I did the speech on banking of the new millennium and they passed Resolution C6 to restructure the global financial architecture with an alternative time-based currency. So time-based money has been proposed in the Millennium Declaration resolution and uh, we have this wonderful opportunity now to get some help maybe out of these multi-billionaires. Remember, I wrote to Bill Gates 10 years ago. I said, you've got the funds to organize and be the veins and arteries of all our transactions in the underground economy. He didn't do anything. 10 years later, nothing's been done. But anyway, that is my pitch going into the dragon's den. So here's what happened. First of all, I walk in there and uh, I guess I didn't make them too happy when I walked up and said, hey, if engineering winners is being a dragon, meet the king of the dragons. So maybe they weren't too happy about that, but I got to explain how come my poker chip from Brantford didn't lose its value, but the poker chip from the other government did. These are both government tokens. How come one inflates, the other one doesn't? Well, anyway... I explained how interest works, how we wanted to get rid of it, and then I went into showing how the Berkshires were working, the cash buy-in systems, because I'm pitching these boys to buy into the Toronto or the Calgary dollar system, since I hear there's at least one from Toronto, one from Calgary. Now, in my case, I want them to give me 100000 lend to me, so I can buy into the Brantford dollar system, and I'll give them the premium on that loan and get my Brantford system going. But anyway, that's what I wanted to do. My hundred grand to start Brantford because I didn't want to start Toronto. It's already there. In Calgary, it's already there. Now, one guy caught on. Said, hey, your article said only five, 95%. You get 100. That's only 5%. You're offering us 10. Well, I, before I could get to the Pittsburgh where they were given 90, I mean, you were paying 90 to get 100, which is 11%. And before I could say, hey, we'll give you 10, who cares, they're only giving you 5. Another one jumps on me, and they're complaining, two of them going, we want the interest on our savings. And I'm trying to say, you don't need it when you get a 10% premium up front, do you? Another one jumps on me, one of them's an engineer, says I'm an engineer. And when I was explaining how this works, he says, well, listen, I don't think it can work. Well, I point at all the newspaper articles, and I go, it is working. I laughed at him, I said, you're an engineer? Well, he sneered back at me and started laughing at me. So I said, yeah, I took out my $500 poker chip. I said, yeah, put your money where your mouth is. Well, all of a sudden, Mr. Dragon ain't laughing so much. And then I hit him with my standard coup de grace, flash the cash, bye-bye trash. And he didn't do anything, so <laughs> I guess my bet may have won that point. But then it turned into a bear pit. They're all jumping. But don't forget, I picketed the Bank of Canada for five years in the early 80s. And I argued with the economists coming out for five years. I faced every butt they can dream of. And I put them down as fast as they shot them up. So maybe I wasn't as gentle as I should have been. But anyway, uh, those who needed it got torched. And uh, see, they were expecting a desperate beggar like all the others. And I wasn't there begging them. I was there to turn them on to a good thing. So you're not getting a pauper beggar here. You're getting the king of the paupers, and it ain't the same thing. So fortunately, next week, I go register in the by-election in St. Paul's in Toronto. And I'm going to be able to suggest that Toronto people go down and buy into the Toronto dollars so they can make their 10% premium and then watch the Dragons to see if any of them were smart enough to do it too. So the producer, as I was leaving, bet me 10 bucks. I said they're going to cut out the king of the dragons from their show. They can't have me torching some of their little dragons, their, their pussy dragons. And he bet me 10 bucks they wouldn't cut me. And so I'll pay him a $10 Brantford casino chip, and he'll go buy some Toronto dollars to pay me if I win. So, of course, Flash the Cash, Termel told them to bet on their own hometown community currency. Let's see if any of the bye-bye trash don't buy in, and let's see if any do because they have until the show to buy in and make their 10% profit. And I don't know if any of them have or will, but we will know by the show whether or not they reject the idea of making their 10% up front on their own community currency. 
I've done an audio tape while I was there. I had my audio cassette recorder. So if they don't play it, I will end up posting at least the audio of the exchange between the pussies in their dragon den and the king of the dragons on the day that I showed up.